Welcome to season one, two, three, four, five of Meet the Drapers, the world's largest international business plan competition. We're going global. We traveled the globe scouring the US, India, Taiwan, Portugal, Canada, and Brazil for their best and brightest entrepreneurs. This is amazing. Every week, these entrepreneurs will compete against their countrymen for a chance to make it to our international semi finals and then on to finals to compete for a $1 million investment from Tim Draper himself. The crystal ball ultimately chooses. But here's the twist. Your favorite business eliminated too early? Vote them back into the finale to get a second chance in front of judges Tim, Polly and Bill Draper as well as their VIP guest judges. Let the games begin. Hey, welcome back to Meet the Drapers. This is our second episode of our one, two, three, four, fifth season. This season, we are going all the way around the world. Today's show is really just about California. We've got some great judges, Bill Draper and my sister Polly. Our guest judge today is Scott McNeely. Scott was the founder of Sun Microsystems and he did it from the very beginning. He built it all the way up. He now runs something called Curriki, which allows all of you out there to create curriculum that can be used on a standard platform. Scott has also been on the show before, so he is already considered a draper. So welcome to the show, Scott. It's nice to be a draper. I just uh, hope I'm uh, written into your will. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> It might be in small print. <laughs> Great to have you, Scott. You have gotten to become quite an expert in education. How has the world of education changed? How are you trying to change it? What's it gonna look like in 10 years? You know, with all of the advances in technology and the changes in, in the world landscape, you become skills obsolescent at about a rate of 15 to 20% per year. And so lifelong learning has become an absolutely critical component of staying useful and valuable in, in the workforce. The concept of being able to stop what you're doing in life to get better at something is just untenable for most people. And you're gonna have to do it, uh, we call it K to grade. You're gonna have to keep keep training yourself and the tools and the network and and technology are going to be the way we deliver that kind of learning experience to uh, people at all times. Terrific. So let's bring on the first entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Hi, I'm Tom Zarega, the founder and CEO of Magnetic 3D. I started Magnetic 3D with the idea that eventually this technology would make it to the home. You know, when I think about the future, I think about the movies I saw in the 80s, like Back to the Future, where Jaws is coming off uh, and eating Marty McFly off the, the side of the billboard. That's the future that we're going towards. And if you look at it, it's a, it's a future that doesn't require a headset or 3D glasses to experience holographic 3D content. We imagine in the not so distant future because of the tech that we're developing today, it's no longer science fiction, that you'll be surfing the internet in 3D. It's, it's a big world out there. A lot of people have different perspectives. As an entrepreneur, I feel like I share the same view of the world as Tim, and that's really important. Um, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to come here to pitch our company. Tim would be an awesome partner and uh, couldn't think of anybody better to work with. No matter what, something's gonna be gained today and I'm excited to be here. Well, let's hear from our first entrepreneur, Tom Zarega from Magnetic 3D. Our company solves an age-old problem that's kept 3D in the movie theaters for over 100 years, the need to wear 3D glasses. Consumers love 3D, but nobody really wants to wear the 3D glasses, right? Why not? Well, let's face it, the glasses They suck. look good on yeah, you. <laughs> they look ridiculous. Uh, they give people nausea, headaches, eye strain. And then of course you got VR, right? And VR does promise to bring 3D to the masses, 
But there's a catch. Everybody needs to get a headset so they can experience the content. What if you didn't actually have to wear the device at all? We've come up with a platform that's a game-changing solution. We can take a lens and put it on a TV and our device wears the glasses instead of the viewer. And you're looking at it right here, holographic 3D content that appears to float in midair oh, like magic. that's great. Interesting. And with these VR and 3D superpowers, we're gonna make the metaverse more accessible without having to wear glasses or a headset. Is it only with graphical uh, content or can it be like movies or whatever? We can do anything. Yeah, we can take 3D movies and put them into this format. We sell proprietary 3D displays, software, and content to the world's largest brands. And now we're licensing our enterprise tools to customers such as agencies and artists so that they can produce this content in our format. We will scale this company by over a hundredfold by offering these tools as a service. So the market size for this is pretty incredible. We're talking a trillion dollar market opportunity between hardware, software, and content. And we are the premium solution carving out our niche as the Tesla of TV. That's because glasses-free 3D is really a transformative technology that cuts across a number of different verticals. It's all business to business. You're not trying to get to the consumer because eventually, as a consumer, I'm gonna wanna have this. Just at South by Southwest a couple weeks ago, for the first time, we put our screens up and we had a QR code on it for customers to whitelist to get an NFT with the display. And we actually managed to get over 50 hey, signups. Look at that. No oh. way. Wow. <laughs> yeah, good timing. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> You know, the, the reality is that this technology is going to make it into the home with 3D and NFTs because art is really the intersection. How much are they? Uh, we charge about 7000 for this unit and then $20 a month uh, for maintenance and support. That contract goes for about three years. How do you uh, activate the 3D capabilities? So there's a passive lens that's optically bonded to the front of the display and we serve up a number of different views of content. So wherever you're standing, within about 140 degrees of viewing, you'll pick up the 3D content automatically. It's taken you a lot of money to get here, right? Yeah. How, yeah. how much have you raised? Uh, Three million. Yeah. Oh, not, not too as bad. much as I thought. Do you have any of it left? Any of it left? No, no, I put all my blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. <laughs> so yeah, I think at, you know, at this point, we really need to raise capital to bring on. How sales. much? Are we raising? Six. Six million. Would you be able to do this with like a Super Bowl? Yes. I mean, if we took our tools and licensed them, right now we're working in theme parks with a lot of the entertainment companies. If we sell horizontally into them, they could start using our tools to do broadcast TV. Is it a couple of layers of content or is it a continuous thing? It's continuous. We actually film the content with nine cameras at nine. the same time. Right. And by doing that, we, we create a natural motion parallax, because we're getting different views of content in front of the display. What would be the cost for, they're coming out with the new Top Gun, to take that movie to 3D, how long and how expensive would it be to do that? So the, the good news is we actually know a lot of the companies that work in this area, and we've actually tested their conversion. They use a lot of conversion technology to take 2D and make it into 3D. I didn't know that was even possible. They can take a, a, a regular 2D movie and turn it into 3D. Oh yeah, yeah. Even movies like uh, Marvel, they have thousands of animators that work for months at a time taking those those shots and rotoscoping out and cutting out the characters and painting everything back in. That 2D to 3D conversion process is completely compatible with our technology. Wow. Yeah. If we were added as an extension to the movie and they wanted to output in this format, it's probably an incremental cost to just format slightly for this version of the screen you know so maybe an extra 10 percent on what they're spending so how are you going to sell this you're going to start with these uh, SaaS opportunities yes and and they're going to pay you a well are they paying you seven dollars seven thousand a unit plus 20k a month or are they paying you like some other way right now most co companies are buying the screens from us outright we're working with really large companies they're putting us into their budgets but ultimately, if we want to scale, I think like a lot of companies right now in the hardware side are doing platform as a service. So what we'd like to do is bundle the screen with the software and the tools so that they can go ahead, buy these and pay a monthly fee. Do you have any revenues now? Yes. Yeah, we've, uh, the company's done um, over eight, 8 million in sales over our history. And we're doing about 50 to 60,000 a month right now. Honestly, we're getting so many leads in, we can't uh, get back to all of them. <laughs> Uh, for the technology. So we're trying to bring on um, more salespeople and that's what we need the capital for. But 50 to 60K means you're doing like, 
you know, less than a million dollars a year. Yeah. And you've done 12 million over this time. So clearly there was another product or another life. Yeah, well, we got hammered with COVID. <laughs> Nobody could see it. So 2018, what were the revenues in 2018? Uh, we were, we've pretty much been uh, at 50 to 60,000. And then we've had big projects that have happened. We did the Hard Rock Hotel. We did their guitar hotel with a 100 inch screen scanned in uh, the top 10 guitars from their collection, brought Bob Marley back to life playing in the lobby. And, we, and they spent, you know, close to half a million dollars working on that project to put in 100 inch 3D displays in the hotel. So we've had moments where we've done big deals like that. What does it cost you to make that? 2,000 to 2,500, depending on the volume. So the margins are 70%. Yeah, we do pretty well. Terrific. Yeah. Great. But well, listen, wait a so minute, much. wait a minute. Well, <laughs> I object. Okay. <laughs> you are showing his book and not my book. We can, we can <laughs> fix this problem. <laughs> That's something I can do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Now, thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, so good to see you. Thank you very much. So as a part of making Meet the Drapers even more fun, even more fun than it is, we have instituted a new game. It's called Draper X, and you can download it on the iPhone or on Google Play. You can participate. And so while you watch Meet the Drapers and you see these great entrepreneurs present, you can invest your funny money into those companies. And if your company goes and becomes a semi-finalist, you get 5X on your money. If in the semifinals, your company moves up to the finale, you get another 5X on your money. If your company ends up winning, you get another 10X on your money. Because so we're gonna have a leaderboard and the winners are gonna get big prizes from Meet the Drapers. I hope you'll download the game. It's called Draper X and you'll play it with us and be a part of Meet the Drapers. So what did all of you out in TV land, think of the, this amazing company. Would you want to pay $7,000 and get one of these 3D TVs or what? Scott, what did you think? I think it's very interesting. I think it's very clever and it's a smarter way to go do that. I just, um, you know, each company is going to have to go out and create their content and then hopefully they have a leveraged reason to go put it in place somewhere and i was trying to think of what kind of company could roll this out in volume and why would they and everybody says well i'll do this if it becomes the thing but making it the thing will be hard to do polly what did you think i don't know i think uh everybody will would hear you could watch a movie without 3d glasses and suddenly get all excited about putting that you know, being the one to put that in their TV. I agree that there's no content, but my guess is if they heard that people were buying TVs with 3D things in them, everybody would do a 3D ad. Everybody would make more 3D movies. It, it's kind of exciting to people to, to feel like they're part of this thing that they've always wanted. I totally agree with Polly. Uh, the, everything she said, uh, and she knows film industry better than I do. So I would just say, I agree. I'm kind of excited about this. It does start in the marketing departments. People buy it just to see one movie. Yep. <laughs> Once a few people have it, wow, it, yeah. it's all over the world. Yeah, I remember yeah. when our next door neighbors had a color TV. Yeah. And I had a black and white, we had a black and yeah. white TV. You had to get it. And we we kept yeah. pushing you to get a color TV. Our next entrepreneur is coming, but before we see him, let's see what's going on behind the screen or behind the scenes. <laughs> behind, the, <laughs> behind the 3D screen. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex Cree. I'm the creator and co-founder of Bauza. My partner and I both have a little bit of that spirit of hospitality in us. And so when I came up with the idea for Bauza, it was kind of this perfect opportunity to blend East and West and to really truly fuse two food cultures into something uh, relatively new. And so to bring those two concepts together, 
to us means uh, that we can have you know, large impact on a lot of people and bring a little bit of happiness and, and joy. Okay, welcome back. We've got our next entrepreneur here. It's Alex Cree with Bowza. Greetings, Drapers. Bowza is a Chinese steamed bao bun, magically fused, stuffed with delicious, gooey, cheesy pizza fillings. And we are the perfect hot, savory snack that's ready in only one minute. Our story began in Beijing, China in 2016. We had this idea to fuse pizza and the Chinese street food called bao buns. We realized that people absolutely loved this fusion. We then moved into retail, small restaurants, ghost kitchen delivery, and then we opened up a flagship retail location in Shanghai. We finally felt confident enough to take on the United States market, which is about a five and a half billion dollar a year market for frozen pizza and frozen pizza snacks. Are you in the Mavs games? I mean, can I eat this stuff when I'm watching a Mavs game? Not yet. We're working on uh, food service distribution that would enable a lot of stadiums and places like that. What are your revenues so far? Revenues in 2021 uh, on a consolidated basis, our Chinese entity and our US entity were 755,000 US dollars. What's your margin on this? Uh, in the United States, gross margins currently a little over 35%. Do you have a different margin in China? There's a little bit less trade spend, uh, we, but it's roughly the same. It's about, about that 35%. What is the net margin uh, when you're at 35%? Really depends on the channel. Say the net margin right now hangs around kind of the five to 10% range. And how long are these things staying on the shelves and how much sell through do you have? You know, it's a bit early to really, um, you know, have too deep of an understanding. We don't have a, a access to spins data, but uh, the product seems to be moving quite well already uh, without even you know, much marketing uh, or much brand awareness. We're already in the top half of the category uh, as just a completely fresh new product that nobody's ever heard of. Are we going to try them out? Uh, yes. In fact, let me you just You have a microwave them. up there. Yes. You'll have to stuff it into the microphone or something. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Holly, this is yeah. for you. This is our cheesy spinach. Nice. Pepperoni. Ooh, this looks amazing. This is not a bite-sized snack. Oh, wow. So what's really, what's really deal. cool about these guys is we have a, a bit of an unfair advantage in America's freezer aisles. Big food companies have been trying to engineer yeah. their baked dough and their fried dough to be you know, more though. soft, more tender, right? You have a lot of food R&D that's gone into making this kind of rising crust. Well, we don't have that problem because we are a steamed product, right? One that's sold, you know, 60 billion of these are sold per year in Asia, but Bao has not really made it super deep into the US. And so our unfair advantage is that we're adding moisture in the cooking product which makes for a much more, um, a, a much better microwave reheating process. We take that a step further with a proprietary microwave steamer bag. This heats in your microwave in only 60 seconds. You don't even open the bag. It goes straight hey, to the freezer. I think this presentation is about as good as I've seen ever. But the taste of this to me is very bland and not really much. I mean, I, I wouldn't come back to it. Oh boy, my, mm. I, mine lit I up. I say a whole different, uh, I have a I, different we point had of a, view. They, you had different uh, you had their, things. We had their best seller, which is the cheesy spinach. Pepperoni is actually our best seller. Oh, it is? Dad, pass me the pepperoni. He's <laughs> not a he's not a pizza lover anyway. People care a lot about pizza based on the crust. So this is like a... So you lose the crust, so you, but you, you got this whole new bow thing. thing. This is and a it's special a little, dough. It's a little um, mushy, mushier than what you'd get in a pizza crust. It's, it's designed to be soft and fluffy. So a, a, a steamed bao bun, it's almost spongy in its texture. What's the bao made of? Is it gluten-free or what, what, what? Is it a rice based? No, or what it's, it? it's made in a relatively traditional fashion. We got to work side by side with real bao pros uh, for many years, but it's made out of wheat flour. Do you make it here in the US or you make it in China and fly it here? Both. So we have co-packing in China, which we've been working on since roughly 2017. That's how we kind of cut our teeth and learned how to make this stuff. And we have co-packing here in California. What's the, the biggest customer you have there? 
Currently, our largest customer is Sprouts. Um, Harris Teeter is new. Uh, Meyer and Whole Foods, we think, are going to reset probably roughly around the summer, July period. Uh, Big Y and Price Chopper are kind of regional players. What's the barrier to entry for uh, a pizza chain or uh, any of the other packaged goods folks to just offer the, the exact product to what you're doing? I, I'm very glad that you asked that uh, because these are very hard to make. There's a lot going on and there's, first of all, there's a lot of trade secrets. This product, uh, there's a reason you get that stretchy cheese. Other people have tried and they don't do it. We've been at this for four solid years in the factories, polishing this. We have kind of the runway that others would be naturally late to, uh, might not have capacity for, and would certainly have a hard time navigating to get to a product of, of our quality. Terrific, well they are delicious. And thank you, Alex, for being on Meet the Drapers. Thank you, Tim. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Tim Draper. If you got a great idea, go ahead and send it to me. And who knows, you might be the next big contestant. We'll be right back after this. Terrific. So what did you think in TV land? What did you think of Bowza? Well, you didn't get to taste it, so <laughs> it's really going to be have to be up to the judges. And poor Scott didn't get to taste it either. So let's start with Scott. Scott, what did you think of of Alex Cree and Bowza. Uh, you know, I, I hear his uh, barriers to entry, but I just, it's another pizza product. It's another frozen food pot product. I don't see any huge trend or wave. I'm not sure that, you know, Chinese buns are going to take the world by storm. How about you, Dad? What do you I think? I am totally with, in agreement with you. First of all, I thought it was hard. I just ate some. And, and getting to the inside core, the, the tasty part of it was very thick, a, a very hard to get there. So I would never buy it. Polly, what'd you think? <laughs> I thought it was really good, but I like bao buns. So it's chi I love the Chinese, uh, those little buns. And part of the fun of those is the doughy, chewy, doughy stuff that, you know, get, and then you get the little magic pop of inside when you get, when you reach it. You know, I, I love these things. <laughs> they were delicious. They were part Chinese and part American. And there's- Or and, part Italian. And if you pull them apart like that, there's still sort of a bridge between the two countries. Oh. And I think that keeping peace between these two countries, peace uh, between these two countries, <laughs> is a good idea. But your, your, whole, theory, your to... whole theory is shot because it, a pizza is Italian. It's no, it's not. not. We invented pizza. We invented pizza. That's we true. We invented French fries and we invented pizza. <laughs> That's, That's true. Funny. So okay. let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But before we do, Let's see what's going on behind the scenes. My name is Vignesh and I am the founder of Canvas. I've been an entrepreneur since I was 17 and uh, I've always been building tools for creators since then. Being a writer myself and I always struggle to, uh, you know, make money or living out of my creative uh, passion. More like my life's manifestation to kind of converge with Canvas creators are disembodied today. You know, they are spread across multiple platforms and they are confused as to what they can do to start making a sustainable living out of it. Canvas is a moonshot of an idea where we are striving to create and build that power back to the creative community. A validation from someone like Tim and that we are able to be a part of this show today itself is a validation for me and Canvas. All right, let's hear from our next entrepreneur. This is Vignesh from Canvas. Uh, Vignesh, give us your pitch. Hello guys, first of all, I'm super excited to be here. So Canvas is a micro monetization platform where creators can create, monetize, and distribute their work across channels. 
So me and my co-founder Madan, uh, you know, we have been creators ourselves and we have been figuring out what are the challenges which are faced by creators. I am a writer and I've always struggled to make money out of my own writing. And this has been going on for more than 13 plus years. And Madan being a celebrity creator in India, uh, he has always faced challenge in terms of protecting his content. There are millions of creators like me and Madan today, YouTubers, podcasters, you know, there are different types of creators who are exactly going through the journey like us. That's how Canvas was born with a mission to enable or democratize the creators to start thinking about monetization and how they can protect their content. So there are basically three steps. Step one, the creators can actually integrate their work from a WordPress or YouTube or any of the platforms, or they can use the editor as you can see, they can create it right here. Step two, they can use a patent pending micro monetization module where they can select any blocks. You can see that, you know, they can select a couple of seconds. It could be, you know, a paragraph or it could be an entire content and they can set value in crypto or normal currency. And even they can publish these content as NFTs. In step three, which is where like, you know, they are able to distribute in a click of a button to, uh, let's say a platform like OpenSea or any of the platforms like Facebook or the creator's choice. Terrific. Now, what I saw there, you you had an audio file, but you said you're a writer. Yeah. And I didn't see whether you did also uh, video editing or, or text or uh, graphic uh, we do. editing. Yeah, we do. So you do a little bit of all of that. So yeah. are you going to, you look at yourself as competing with Adobe? No, we are not. So that's where we become interesting. So we are more of an API. Right now you see it as a API platform where we can be integrated with any of the creator uh, economy startups in a click of a button. So for example, one of the deals which we have done is with a leading NFT marketplace where they don't have any of the marketplace, they don't have a create functionality. They have only upload functionality. So using the editor, there'll be a create button which will be powered by Canvas. So that kind of an integration is what we are looking at. It could be uh, media houses, it could be production houses. So everybody can use Canvas in their backend right now. Now, does Adobe or Pro Tools, can they publish to NFTs yet? No, they can't. But don't you think that when they publish to NFTs, that puts you in a very awkward position? Uh, no, uh, the main difference is because we are giving the complete control to the creator. So is your strength that it's really easy to use for a creator? What's going to be your avenue where people say, because I use Canvas, this? Our strength is basically the way in which creators can start thinking about making money right away. You're a writer. Yeah. And you're writing what? Let's say, just just t t walk me through because I am feeling very uh, stupid right now. Well, I don't she's quite a creator, yeah, and she'd like to make money. Yeah. So how does that help her? Let's say as a writer, uh, predominantly you will be using, uh, you know, something like a Medium or a WordPress today, right? I'd be using like a Final Draft to write my script. Perfect. Perfect. So if you're a script writer today, what happens predominantly is that you know. Imagine treating Canvas where you can either integrate your final draft or you can upload your file with your content, okay? And then you can either, because it's a script, you can start interacting with your uh, editors or with whomever you want to in new ways. One, you can select the final uh, couple of chapters or couple of important parts. And now if you want to interact anything beyond or if it has some level of research in it, you will be able to, they have to interact with it either pay or they can own it after they interact with that particular block, if that makes sense. Yeah, so Polly, I'm feeling a little confused here. I'm not sure why I want to buy a book, you know, a page or a paragraph or a, um, uh, a, a chapter at a time. That, that seems a little more complicated. The micro chopping up of all of these little things. I don't want to buy a couple of phrases in a song or whatever. Maybe, maybe people want to sell their stuff that way. I don't want a part of an image. Uh, I, I, I want the photograph. So the other thing is NFTs is still something I'm struggling with. I'm an old guy, but uh, I remember Pet Rocks and I remember Beanie Babies. And so NFTs sort of feel like they're in that genre right now. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So again, uh, I think as you rightly said, NFT is a new technology and there is a scope for a lot of innovation there. So it's more like a timestamp for us. So a creator can, knows, let's say, what happens when a content gets bought out, what happens after that. So a life cycle is very creator, clear for a creator, which is the boon, boon of NFT, which is why we are excited about that. Terrific, Vignesh. 
Very nice meeting you and thanks for being on Meet the Drapers. Scott, what did you think of Canvas? I don't get it. So I'm, I just, I, there's lots of ways to create content, lots of ways to turn it into an F NFT. There's lots of ways to publish to content management systems and there's paywalls and all the rest of it out there. I just, I just don't know what this does for me. Polly, what'd you think? Ditto, uh, ditto. Okay, Dad, <laughs> what'd you think? I liked him because he's Indian. He came from India. I made a lot of money and with a bunch of Indians. I think making it easy for somebody to create something, turn it into an NFT, I think that is potentially something valuable. And with that, let's bring on our fourth entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Hi, my name is Chase Palmieri, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Creditor Inc. In the early days of starting Creditor, we didn't have any money. We were working at my family restaurant just to kind of make rent. We couldn't pay ourselves. We were living off of quesadillas for the first two years. And we were just kind of building product, trying to figure out if there was a way to review online news and how that would work. It was basically a struggle of taking our side hustle and trying to make enough in, uh, in angel capital that we could actually pay ourselves to work on the business and that's where we're at today. Creditor will never tell you what you can or can't read or what you should or shouldn't read. At the end of the day, Creditor is about empowering readers all around the world to hold media accountable, which we believe is, is completely necessary, not just now, but for all future generations. So as a part of making Meet the Drapers even more fun, even more fun than it is, we have instituted a new game. It's called Draper X, and you can download it on the iPhone or on Google Play. You can participate. And so while you watch Meet the Drapers and you see these great entrepreneurs present, you can invest your funny money into those companies. And if your company goes and becomes a Semi-finalists, you get 5x on your money. If in the semi-finals, your company moves up to the finale, you get another 5x on your money. If your company ends up winning, you get another 10x on your money. So we're going to have a leaderboard, and the winners are going to get big prizes from Meet the Drapers. I hope you'll download the game. It's called Draper X, and you'll play it with us and be a part of Meet the Drapers. Hey, so let's hear from our next entrepreneur. Our next entrepreneur is Chase from Creditor. Chase, give us your pitch. Today, Creditor is the world's leading content review platform, and we're on a mission to restore consumer and advertiser trust in the news industry. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the record level of distrust in online news. It's probably something you've dealt with in your own lives, but what you might not know is how it is now hurting advertising revenue on content platforms and for digital advertisers. They don't want their ad placements to show up next to things like fake news, disinformation, or misinformation. Creditors often referred to as the rotten tomatoes for news, and this actually makes a lot of sense because we allow verified journalists to rate individual articles under the critic score and the general public to rate articles under the public score. And all of these different article reviews aggregate into overall credibility scores for each article, author, and news website. Today, Creditor is aggregating reviews through our four live products. We have our Creditor.com website, our Chrome browser extension, our Twitter curator app, where we can actually scrape reviews right off of Twitter, and our iOS app. And all of these reviews are feeding Creditor's proprietary content credibility database. And so Creditor makes money by charging an annual licensing fee to our customers for access to the database. And our target licensing customers include digital advertisers and ad agencies, social media platforms, search engines, web browsers, and news aggregators. Who are the people that are, that are able to judge whether this is true or it's not? It's an aggregate of... Yeah, we're essentially crowdsourcing content reviews. We're the first of its kind to... Uh, no, but you, you had a group that you were giving more credence yeah, so, to. So verified journalists rate under a separate score, which is called the critic score 
They so who verifies a journalist? Uh, we have a way of, uh, we have some basic critic requirements, but basically they just need to be actively creating three articles per month at a publication today. We also outsource our verification to Twitter's check mark. So Chase, I, I love what you're doing. There's nobody who trusts anything they see, hear, or read less than me. <laughs> and that's a real problem to know what to do. I'm not sure I'll ever trust a for-profit organization to bring me the truth. But the three things I always want to know about somebody who's sharing some truth with me is, who did you vote for the last 10 years? Secondly, who's paying you what over the last 10 years? And three, who have you donated to uh, over the last 10 years? And then I can get, then I can kind of triangulate and figure out where your bias is. I don't, I don't think that that's what he's talking about though. I think he's talking about journalists that have to do fact checks. Yeah, and but I'd fact, like to know the journalists, no the journalists. About a, there's a, a fact is a fact. If I can interrupt, I can help clarify this. So Credit is actually the only example in the world right now where we are keeping track of people's reviews, which are always transparently visible and open to the public and journalists on individual articles, authors, and outlets. That's all transparently visible on our platform because we're basically like a Rotten Tomatoes for news, where a creditor is never telling anyone what to trust or what content to engage with. We are simply creating free and open review tools so that news consumers can connect in real time from anywhere and review the content that they're already reading. And there are no bots. There are no, no bots allowed to in no, the week. No bots, no black boxes. Every single review is accounted for and transparently visible. You, you understand exactly what goes into each score. And what do you need the money for? It sounds like you kind of got it off and running. Do you, wait, are you getting revenue at all? Yeah, so we just uh, launched our, our database license in January. We've secured our first three annual contract agreements. Um, we're just finishing up the trial period there, but we we have those annual license agreements set, and we have uh, five different programmatic advertisers reviewing their agreements right now, as well as one major web browser. Um, I, What's I, all that going to add up to in revenue for 2022? Expecting 2.4 million in annual recurring revenue run rate by the end of the year. And so, why take any money? You got if you got all that revenue coming in. So, so we're actually in the middle of our pre-seed raise. Our big problem right here is that. To date, we've been bootstrapped and we've been building product and uh, building this review platform that is really kind of a revolutionary technology. And now we're transitioning from more of a sales and marketing operation as we start to sell access to the database. And so we need to make more marketing, sales, and customer support hires to really get into market faster. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for being on Meet the Drapers. It was great. I'm looking forward to seeing great things out of Credit. So what did all of you think of Credder? Sounds like cheddar, but that was the last, that was the pizza one. <laughs> That's <word>. cheese. <laughs> Dad, what did you think of Credder? I make up my mind about the articles that I read and the newspapers that I get. And I really think I would, you know, not listen to Credder. I make up my own mind. So maybe I'm too old. <laughs> he uses a straight-up New York Times that you hold in your hands. Yeah, and, he, and Walter Cronkite was one yeah, of Dad's Yeah, those were buddies. his two things. Yeah. And that was always the way it was. Yeah, That's right, yeah, yeah, the yeah. way yeah. it that was. That was yeah. the way it was. Polly, what would you think of Credder? I think it's, it's so necessary right now in today's times, and I think it's... A, Why? Because unlike you, I get the New York Times and 27,000 other, everything else, every other social media. For kids growing up in this generation, it is really hard to, for, to formulate who you are, what your opinions are, and who should be trusted. I think it's, I think it's a vital thing for now. Scott, tell me, what, what did you think of Credder? It's trying to solve a very virtuous and needed, I'm with Polly, people don't know, and especially the young kids don't know. I mean, there's so much coming at us. I, I'm very skeptical that a dot .com, a for-profit company, will uh, not be bought. 
and therefore the truth can can change and so you know there's it, it's it's all it's all random and uh i just don't know how you do this i don't know how you do this in this day and age unless it's a not-for-profit and you get to knowing who's saying what and i know their biases everybody has a bias and uh aggregating biases doesn't change fact but it sounds like with <clears throat> this he is basically just uh he said every single article gets, you can see the reference to it and you can see how it came to, you know, you can see how it got its rating, not on facts. I think this is interesting. Of course, I've seen five that are just like it who have all died. Oh. And so I'm trying to figure out whether their model is the one that everybody's going to uh, be attracted to and it's going to be a challenge. Okay, so this is interesting because when there's this much passion around a business, yeah. it's usually good news. Terrific, so now we've got to decide which of these four great companies is moving forward onto the semifinals. So let's bring on the entrepreneurs and we'll go through and see what the crystal ball has in store. Well, thank you so much. These were some of the best, most interesting presentations we've ever seen on the show. It's an exciting time, and I really like your, your choice of reading. Uh, <laughs> very nice. I'm glad everybody's reading The Just Startup Hero. Only one of you will go forward to the semifinals, but I want you all to keep in touch because as businesses grow, they get bigger and more interesting and better, and we may change our minds as time goes on. Chase with Credder, you're hitting a real nerve. You're hitting sort of a third rail. I've seen five companies before this that have tried and failed to do something similar. How do you keep your own bias out of this? Twitter all of a sudden had its own bias, so did Facebook. How are you not gonna be affected by an advertiser who comes up and says, I'm gonna give you this much money, but you're gonna to have to give us slightly better biases. There are gonna be things that are gonna change and being in a business, it's gonna be interesting. Vignish with Canvas. We were a little confused as to where this was really going and what, what your true skill was gonna be. What, what, what makes you uniquely qualified to run this business? What makes this business so special that customers are just gonna fly to it? Is this really the way creators are gonna make money? We were a little concerned about uh, whether this was just a, a feature and not really a business or not really a, an industry changer. And then we got Alex with Bowser. We had differing opinions on how that thing tastes. It was delicious to me. This is just one of a lot of things that go into that freezer rack and you gotta really sell hard. You gotta get that thing everywhere. And also there may be a cultural mismatch. The reason I like it is because I love the Chinese food and I love the American food and I love this sort of fusion thing that's happening. It's a peace thing between those two countries and you're kind of bringing them together. And I loved it, I thought it was fantastic. But margins are low in that business, uh, cash flow can be a real issue, you gotta turn them very quickly to make it work. And then we got Tom with Magnetic 3D, that was an extraordinary image and I think I had seen it before and was not blown away by it. But now seeing it, I'm thinking this could be really something special and something I'd want in my, in my living room, as long as you can get content there. And maybe you start on the content side by going after marketing departments and their budgets, and then it starts to spread and people see it in different conferences, and then content starts coming, and then Polly makes a movie that goes in 3D, and then it becomes a big deal. And so we really struggled, as you can see, that we've got pluses and minuses, and it was a real struggle to figure out where it came out. And so we have to go to the crystal ball because we were stumped. So uh, I'm gonna need everybody's power. You know, Scott, if you could like put your hands up like this a little bit so I can get it from the crystal ball. I'm feeling very 
you know, whether it's tasty or feely or, or is it going to change facts or is it going to, you know, is it going to be You magnetic? better hurry up or I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little confused, but I think it's come out very clearly now. Ah, magnetic 3D. Boom. You are moving on. You get the $50,000 investment and you are moving on to the semifinals. Congratulations, Thank you Tom. So much, Sam. Thank you all. Great to have you on Meet the Drapers! That's what we do. Yes! That was awesome. That was like completely unexpected. I had no idea that's what was gonna happen after today's show, and I'm super excited to be going on to the semifinals. It makes perfect sense. I'm reading the back of Tim's book right here, and it says he's crazy enough to invest in all of these things, and he's always first, so I'm excited that he's one of the first in Magnetic 3D getting this technology into the home market. It's gonna be awesome. With our tech, AI, VR, Bitcoin is the best. We'll build and work and grow with you, having fun along the way. We'll change the world for better.